All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another recorded edition of the HarmonyCon podcast. Uh, not live this time, unfortunately, but oh well. Uh, with us today, we have a very special guest. She is known for her work on the Wolverine vs. Sabretooth TV series. Uh, the reading. Sorry, I'm losing my own notes. Uh, the Barbie franchise, and of course, most importantly, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, where she is the singing voice of Rarity, Princess Luna, and most recently, Adagio Dazzle, in the upcoming Rainbow Rocks movie. Please welcome Kazumi Evans. Woohoo! Thank and you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> no problem, it's an absolute pleasure. So I'll just go ahead and jump right into it. Awesome. So doing my research, I found that your earliest credit on IMDb is from 2007. Oh gosh, there yeah. Was, there was a little <laughs> TV show called Triple Sensation. Uh -huh. And I admit, I found a clip of you in that <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, but for those who probably aren't aware of what Triple Sensation was, what was it? Ah, okay. Well, Triple Sensation, it was a Canadian um, reality show slash uh, documentary. And what it was is they had a, a panel of judges uh, being like Marvin Hamlish, Sergio Trujillo, Adrian Noble, Cynthia Dale, and Garth Drabinsky. So some huge names in both American and Canadian uh, theater, musical theater world. And they traveled across Canada in search of 12 contestants that were triple threats, people that could sing, dance, and act, and uh, between the ages of 17 and 26. And it, they... We, they, we were put through master classes with the best, the best teachers in um, acting, singing, and dancing from around the world. And uh, it was a documentary slash a contest um, uh, in Toronto. And um, just basically, like, seeing what the process of learning, uh, like, t and taking class, like, in singing, dancing, acting was like. And, yeah, so that was a long time ago now, but... Uh, it was a wonderful experience. So was this something like that you made a video and submitted it, or were there actual auditions to go to? Uh, there were real live auditions live across Canada. So they traveled um, to the east, west, and uh, central Canada. And um, so they had, luckily, auditions in Vancouver. And so I went to uh, the initial auditions in Vancouver, um, and then there were rounds. And, um, you know, they would always uh, come out with this little piece of paper, and if your name was on it, then you were through to the next round. So that's pretty nerve-wracking, and, um, yeah. And then eventually the pool just got smaller and smaller until they picked um, uh, 12 uh, from across uh, the nation, and then the competition was really on from there on in. And so how far in the little competition did you make it? Because the video that I found showed your audition and a couple of little snippets but it didn't actually show anything else uh i made it to the final six so um and what happened is that they eliminated during the master class process and then eventually uh, they got down to the final six which we performed in a big live uh showcase and then they awarded uh three scholarships to the top three um, I didn't end up winning one of the scholarships, but I was just really proud of myself at that time because I was pretty young, um, I was 17, uh, that just to make it to the end. And that was my goal from the start was just to make it to the end. So I didn't miss anything. So I got to go to all the classes and learn as much as I could. So that was good. So it sounds like it was a wonderful opportunity for you then. Oh, yeah. Looking back now, um, I'm really glad in many ways that I didn't realize just how big of an opportunity and experience it was at that time, just because I think I would have psyched myself out at the time. Uh, so I was blissfully ignorant at the time. But I learned so much. And I mean, what an experience. I would kill to go back and do it again, just because knowing what I, all the knowledge I know now and with the, all the life experience I have now, I think it would be 
um, I would take even that much more away from it. But yeah, it was a, a great experience to have at such a young age, for sure. So the whole triple threat thing, singing, acting, and dancing, is really musical theater at its core. So yes. how long have you been interested in the triple threat? Um, the triple threat thing, like, kind of happened by accident. Like, growing up, I, I don't know, I sang for fun. I just, I loved to sing. Like, I was such a Disney kid, loved all the Disney show tunes and whatnot, and old musicals I just kind of fell into by accident. Um, and so I grew up singing to a certain degree, like, and it uh, started taking lessons in my early teens. Um, and then... And I was performing in community musicals, but it wasn't until I was around 14 that I started dancing, just because a friend of mine um, who, like, I was in, like, some chor choral uh, choir with asked me if I wanted to take a ballet class with her. And I said, okay, yeah, you know, sure, that sounds fun. And I fell in love with it after one class. And um, that's when, I guess, the whole idea of being a triple threat just kind of started because I realized looking at people like Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly, they could all dance and sing and act, and that really appealed to me. And yeah, that's how it kind of came together. It wasn't really a conscious choice. It was just more so like this is really fun, and I this is what I enjoy doing. So, you started in ballet. Have you taken other types of dance since then? Tap and jazz but no my definitely my strongest discipline is ballet and then my second would be tap a little bit of tap anyway <laughs> <coughs> excuse me right. no problem so <laughs> after the triple sensation did you do a lot of um musical theater when you were in high school like were you doing high school performances or were you doing community theater um, I started, uh, like, often a pre-professional uh, theater, Royal City Musical Theater, which is in uh, New Westminster, B.C., so pretty much just right outside of Vancouver. And um, so throughout high school, I did Peter Pan and West Side Story with them, which was really fun. Um, I didn't have time to do any high school plays at all because I was in a half-day ballet program. So I would go to school for two hours in the morning, and then I would dance for, like, five hours after that. And it was a special program with my high school. Uh, so between that and dance competitions and then doing uh, plays outside of school, uh, pre-professionally and professionally, um, yeah, my schedule was pretty packed. Um, but then once I graduated and went to university, I was working professionally a lot and was dancing with the Vancouver Opera and uh, doing TV stuff and yeah and that's when I scored My Little Pony I think that was beginning of second year and I was in I was in the, the Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with the Vancouver Playhouse at the time so working professionally in a musical that way and that's when My Little Pony happened So how did you go from musical theater into your voiceover career? Um Okay, the agent I was with at the time uh, asked me if I would be interested, potentially, uh, doing voiceover stuff. And, I, you know, I mean, I thought about it. I said, that sounds really fun. I mean, you, you get to be a cartoon. Uh, awesome. So I went out uh, for a few auditions for about a year and a bit, like, and, you know, got a radio commercial here and there. Um, but then all of a sudden, yeah, like, My Little Pony was the first professional real like big professional voiceover uh, job I had ever gotten and it just happened and I was I guess in the right place at the right time and then that's when my voice career kind of took off uh, and that's been kind of like the main focus over the past couple of years of where my career has gone uh, which is yeah it's, it's interesting huh how things happen just like so that did you originally audition for one of the singing roles or did you audition for an actual uh, a speaking role with a character um i auditioned originally yeah for the speaking roles um like and so like i had callbacks and whatnot for twilight sparkle and uh, some of the other main six um but then uh, didn't end up booking those uh but then i, I remember getting a call from my agent saying okay well daniel ingram um 
this was prior to meeting Dan for the first time, uh, the composer for My Little Pony, Dan Ingram, would like to see you for an audition for uh, the singing voice of Twilight Sparkle. And I said, oh, you know, that sounds fun. All right. So went in and went to his apartment to just kind of went in there. He taught me the My Little Pony opening theme song. And uh, so after listening to it a few times, I sang it back in what I would have thought, you know, would be Twilight Sparkle's voice. And he said, oh, you know, you know, that, that was great. Um, you sound kind of more like Rarity, though. And I was like, okay, you know, sure, cool. What? <laughs> Didn't really think much of it, left. Um, and then, yeah, like, I think it was about a week or so later, they told me that I had landed the singing role of Rarity. And the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so by singing for Rarity, you're singing for... Um... Tabitha St. Germain is the one who voices the character. You do the singing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. going a little further on, we'll come back to early seasons, but I just kind of have to know, was it originally sure. planned for you to also sing for Luna, who is also voiced by mm-hmm. Tabitha, or is that something that just kind of happens naturally? No, it wasn't planned. It, um, it wasn't... Like actually, when the auditions went, uh, what I did, I wasn't even in the original batch of auditions for, for the singing voice of Princess Luna. Um, I mean, I had already done you know a lot of work singing for Rarity on the show, and it was last summer. Yeah, last summer. Um, and anyways, I got a message uh, from Daniel just saying like, hey, like, would you come to the studio and just try like singing for Luna? And, um, like, so they had already auditioned, like, other people for it, um, and then I just went in there and, you know, listened, uh, to YouTube clips of Tabitha speaking for Luna, and then just went in there and did my bit, and that was that. Um, so it was, it, it's not that, like, oh, okay, well, she sings for Rarity, and Tabitha also voices, uh, Luna, so we'll just give it to her. It's like, no, every part that everybody plays on the part, on the show, like, we've all auditioned for again, and tried for it again. Um, so it, it's it's always the auditioning process. It's never just a given. <laughs> I just I, I you have to wonder because they're both Tabitha characters and you sing for both of them. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. And I, I knew fans would probably um, I've gotten that question a lot before, and I knew fans would probably wonder like, oh, like was it just because? Um, but no, and it, it's an absolute pleasure to sing for both. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, had to re-audition for the second one and for Adagio. And speaking of Adagio, Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the upcoming movie, which, uh, as of this recording will be coming out in a week, actually. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, It'll become hitting theaters in a week. September 27th. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Theaters near you. (laughs) Yeah, um, I'll throw a list uh, where you can find theaters near you. I'll put a website up in the description of this video. So if you don't have your awesome. tickets, go and get them. I'd highly recommend it. I have my ticket for next week. Awesome. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so you're going to see it opening day? Oh, for sure, if I can, or as long as uh, it's in theaters for I mean that that's pretty cool like it it was a joy to work on it and finally for it to be out it's very exciting so did you audition for the part specifically of adagio i did um they had a round of auditions for uh for all the three sirens so aria and uh sonata and then adagio and i read for all three and sang for all three and in the audition process, and then, yeah, I booked Adagio. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, uh, Marika Hendrix is Sonata, and mm-hmm. <sighs> who is it that plays the one I can't... It's not in my notes. I didn't actually write it down. Uh, oh, no, that's right. Um, I'm trying to remember her Diana name. Diana Karina. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, of course. I, I'm great with faces, terrible with names. And I know, I'm sorry, Diana, if you've ever listened to this. I, I know who you are. Sorry. Yes, uh, Diana and Marika. They're awesome. Such wonderful women to work with and uh, very talented. And 
yeah, it made my job really fun and really easy for sure. Uh, Marika was actually one of the guests on our live stream. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. Uh, but anyway, so uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, but is Adagio your first speaking role for My Little Pony? Yes. No, don't worry. Uh, yes, she is my first speaking role mm-hmm. as well as singing. Mm-hmm. Um the uh, Battle of the Band song that got released uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. I did listen to that. It's absolutely wonderful. Oh, mm-hmm. thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you who haven't heard it, I'll post a link in the description. Uh, not really sure there's a whole lot of spoilers in there, but spoiler alert anyway. <laughs> Lots of spoilers, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what was it like being... Uh, playing Adagio, playing the main villain? Oh, it was a joy. <laughs> I know that sounds really really funny to say. Absolute joy to be a villain, um, for sure. Just because a lot of roles I've ever gotten, whether it's been musical theater or voiceover, it's always been the ingenue, like, and uh, the, the young, kind of innocent, up-and-coming kind of girl, whereas Adagio, she's a lot darker, and um, uh, she's deliciously evil, which I love. Uh, so that it was a lot of fun, for sure. And uh, Tabitha St. Germain, after that recording, I remember she said to me, she's like, oh, yeah, you know, you're pretty cool when you're bad, you know? Like, you know, you, you make a pretty good villain. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was definitely fun. It seems like a lot of the voiceover people that I've interviewed and spoken to have always stated that playing villains is supremely fun. Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't know what it is about it. Like, it's just... uh, I think also... uh, Like, you just can't help but like them. And I know that sounds a little backwards, but just something about villains, like, because, like the more bad that they're supposed to be like it, you just you just can't help but like them and and you it, they're just so much fun to play um but I, yeah i don't know exactly what it is about it that makes it so much fun but i i think for me it's just because i've never gotten to play a villain before so i think for me that was just really fun like to kind of break that mold so when you were recording rainbow rocks it was a big group record kind of like they do in the show yes yes yeah absolutely we had the whole uh the like, main six in the room and then it was myself marinka and diana for our scenes so what was what was it like in the room what was the atmosphere like in there oh the atmosphere as always um with with uh tabitha ashley um uh, all of, all of those women they it, it's just so much fun and very supportive and everyone's cracking jokes in between uh, takes of certain scenes and um you know it, it, it's it's always such a joy to go to work for sure it, it's always it, yeah like there's never been a day that I don't wake up and I'm not excited to go to work I'm always so pumped to go and um yeah like and it, it's just great to make movies or make stories these animated stories with those guys for sure so <clears throat> when it comes to recording the singing for that show that one's not mm-hmm. done as a group correct no well, um for singing usually like uh, there have been times like whether it's for the series or for rainbow rocks there have been times where you know we'll all be in the studio and we'll just all take turns uh recording our lines for the song but yeah usually how how we do it is we all record our parts separately and then afterwards uh they engineer it uh, and put the song together and all the parts together just because it's hard with everyone scheduling and um just like daniel like he writes such good music brilliant music um but yeah the harmony sometimes can be a bit difficult and we'd be there all day perfecting it trying to do it like in one shot with everyone singing at the same time and uh again with everyone's schedules it's just easier to go in record our own parts and then 
lay down the track after the after the fact. And do you get the music ahead of time, along as well as um, like a music sheet with lyrics where they go? Oh yeah, yeah. We usually get it like maybe anywhere from a week or a few days before the actual record, um, which is always nice. And uh, yeah, it's always fun uh, hearing the recording after. Um, you've put a lot of work in recording it. Like, it's like, oh, I remember learning that piece. That's awesome. So, it's yeah, it's always a cool process to see the finished product after the fact. So, you watch the show then? I do. I've watched a, a few episodes, definitely. Um, well, not a few, I should say. Quite, like, quite a few episodes of uh, the TV series. Um, and I've definitely seen the first Rainbow Rocks. Um, because yeah, like it, it's, it's, so I, I get a big kick out of seeing the finished product and seeing, um, my voice come out of the animated character for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Half the times I'm like, oh, that's me. Oh, oh, that doesn't sound like me. Like it's, it's interesting that how you think you sound in your head. It's totally not what you sound like, um, when other people hear you. So that always kind of blows my mind. Yeah, it's, uh. <laughs> Recording your own voice and then playing it back to you—you you, you never sound like you think that you sound. No, 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 and that's what I always find really fascinating, and that's why I do love watching, um, you know, at certain episodes of the show or even the film. Just yeah, because it, it's a great way to hear what you know other people mm-hmm. hear you, how other people hear you. Sorry. And so, when it comes to singing for Rarity, how? How much do you have to change your voice for that, or is her singing voice more like your natural singing voice? I would say yes. Rarity, uh, she's very, very close to how I sound or how I sing. Um, There's just a couple pronunciation things with her because, you know, she's almost a little bit slightly British. So you have to... um, there's like that small tweak in accents and how you would say certain words and not hitting your R's so hard. Um, so it'd be like perfect instead of perfect. Um, but yes, rarity is very close to how I sound like when I sing with no added voice. So as a fan of musical theater, a lot of the songs in My Little Pony uh, are kind of derived from musical theater backgrounds like... Uh, uh, Stephen Sondheim is a big one. So is that oh, is yeah. that really fun for you, kind of going like, oh, I recognize this a little bit? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I like uh, there's certain references, um, like whether it's in the animation or in the music, that, yeah, it, it, it that makes it so much fun to sing. And for me, Daniel, he's done a really good job with a lot of my songs, uh, really uh, tailoring the music to fit my voice really well. So when I go into record, it's really easy and it feels natural to sing the music because, you know, everyone's voice is different. Um, I'm not really a rock singer or a really big poppy uh, sort of singer, but um, with like the, the, in this musical theater genre, it just feels natural and it feels good. It just feels like it fits my voice like a glove. And Daniel's done an amazing job of doing that for me. And so that's been really exciting for me um, to sing kind of like original musical theater-esque music for the show. And uh, looking at your IMDb, you have also had a singing role on Lois Pet Shop. I have, yes. Uh, You were credited as featured singer. Mm -hmm. It was, I believe, Blythe. Yes, it's when she goes to fashion school, and it's talking about Fashion University North, I believe, and uh, it was myself and um, a few other singers, uh, Daniel had a group together, and yeah, we helped put that song together, um, singing uh, backup vocals and whatnot for it. And was that another one that you auditioned for, that Daniel just call you up and go, hey, I need background vocals? Uh, yeah, um, it, Daniel on that one, yes, just asked me to do that because over the years with the show My Little Pony, we have worked a fair bit together, which is which is uh, such a pleasure, and uh, of course it was wonderful to be asked to do that. So, uh, outside of My Little Pony, we'll get back to the pony stuff, but 
<laughs> outside of My Little Pony, uh, you've worked in the Barbie franchise as well. I have, I have, yes. Uh, a couple of the animated movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have uh, Barbie Princess Charm School and uh, Barbie and Her Sisters in a Ponytail. Now, I remember Barbies from when I was growing up. My sister had tons of them. So was, <laughs> was yeah. Barbie something that you were into when you were a girl? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Um, absolutely I was. Uh, honestly, like, I feel so blessed for the career I've had so far, whether it's been My Little Pony um, or Barbie, just because these are the toys I, or and Littlest Pet Shop, these are the toys I literally played with growing up. And I'm not making that up just to appease fans or to appear like, oh, like, I, I don't know, just to appear, like, closer to the franchise, but... It, honestly, like, so I feel like six-year-old me, like, if I had gone back in time and told six-year-old me, like, yeah, like, one day you're going to voice characters for this, like, I just would have been over the moon. And six-year-old me inside is, is <laughs> over the moon. Because <laughs> I, it's like, oh, this is a great excuse to get to watch these shit again and play with the toys. And it's part of work. It's for work, right? You know? Like, it's 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 yeah. for work, right? So no one can, no one can uh, you know, be like, oh... You're a little bit too old for that, because I mean, no, not it's it's research. Yeah, it's research. I mean, I'm, I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, mm, mm, yeah. Again, for work. <laughs> hey, if you can accomplish your dreams, go for it. And if you can get if you can get paid oh, to accomplish I, your dreams, even better. Oh, absolutely. And I'm such a big kid at heart. In ways that, you know, it's it's just been a dream come true in that way. And just it's so much fun. Absolutely. Whether it's been working with Barbie or My Little Pony, Lil's Pet Shop, things like that. But yeah, Barbie franchise, that's been fun as well. So you came, well, going back into the pony stuff now, I just, I wanted to branch out into the Barbie a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I acknowledge it, right? I know the bronies, they're like, oh, Mattel, but, you know, we love them too. I love them. Mattel, Hasbro, they're great companies. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so you came into the ponies from the very first season, and the yes. first season was recorded long before anything aired and long before the fandom came around. Crazy, so yeah. I, I have to ask, because almost everyone I've asked this has a different story. How okay. did you first hear about the bronies and the fandom? Um, how I first, okay, um, I think it must have been at one of the voiceover auditions, or I was waiting to record, um, one of my songs, uh, for My Little Pony, and this probably would have been for season two or whatever, as season one was airing, and, um, I think I was talking to Andrea Livman and Tabitha and, and Ashley, and they were, uh, auditioning for either a project, or they were waiting to record stuff, uh, for the show as well. And uh, they just started talking about bronies. And Daniel was there as well, I remember, and he was talking about bronies. And I, I said, bronies? What are you talking about? What's bronies? Uh, like, what are bronies? And th- they're like, oh, well, you know, th- it's the fandom from My Little Pony. And um, they t- explained to me and showed me pictures. And, I, you, you know, like, I, I just thought they were having a go at me, to be honest. Like, I didn't really think anything of it. But then I kept hearing about it, like every session or every audition I went to, kept hearing about the bronies, the bronies, the bronies. And, um, you know, so more and more I became aware of how big the show was becoming and the fandom that was following the show. But it wasn't until I went to Everfree Northwest, uh, the very first time uh, they had that convention back in 2012 in Seattle, that I, I first got you know, my real life, uh, real experience of the bronies and, you know, some of the My Little Pony fans. And I was absolutely awestruck. Like, my mind was blown just because, uh, like, who would have thought, like, My Little Pony would have such a huge impact worldwide. Um, So, yeah. And I was very pleased and uh, a little overwhelmed. But other than that, it's, I mean, the bronies and the My Little Pony fandom worldwide uh are what keeps us coming back so i mean it, it, it's it's a pleasure absolutely and it's a pleasure to be a part of the show 
<laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Doctor Who ringtone. Oh, dear. <laughs> that is <laughs> awesome that you have that ringtone. <laughs> now everyone's like, oh, she's a dork. And I am. I'm a dork. I'm a nerd. Whoops. Now it's it's on tape. Well, you're, <laughs> you're on a brony podcast, so I think you're in good company here. Oh, well, see, and that's what I love about um, the bronies and the fandom. Like, they're just so accepting and so lovely. And um, I think at the last... Uh, no, uh, the last uh, con I went to in Baltimore a few weeks ago, or about a month ago, um, a fellow from Chile gave me a sonic screwdriver, <laughs> and I I just couldn't I just couldn't stop smiling for the rest of the day. I was like, this is awesome, ponies and Doctor Who. I am so happy. <laughs> and that's that's the fun thing about pony conventions because I was at that Brony con as well. That's where you and I first got to uh, meet, actually. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I'm pretty sure I said this to you in person, but I'll say it anyway. It was an absolute pleasure and an honor to meet you there. Thank you very but much. But at these cons, it's not just... I mean, obviously it's predominantly pony. It's a pony convention. But you see your Doctor Whos, and you see your Deadpools, and your Marvel characters. and it, It's yeah. not just ponies. It's it's all-inclusive. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which, I think it kind of says something about the fandom in itself, but that's also a completely different topic. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we really ever had a topic to begin with on this little interview, but we'll we'll figure something. Oh, what? Oh, whatever. I'm I, I'm down for anything. Uh, but no, I definitely noticed that uh, at the conventions. It's like they'll incorporate, which I love. They'll incorporate like whether it's like Doctor Who's or um, like the Marvel characters into like the fan made um, merchandise that you can get for the show. Or you know, there's clearly fans that are or Bronies, Pega Sisters that are fans of the sh- of um, Doctor Who or any of the Marvel franchise and. Uh, I think that's really awesome, and I guess I'm right there with them because yeah, like uh, a show like Doctor Who, like I'm a huge fan of. I have been for years, and uh, it's really cool that the fans, um, I, I guess, like the, that they they bring that to the conventions as well. They feel comfortable incorporating that. And the show itself even incorporates little tongue-in-cheek yeah, things. I I know, which makes me so happy. Um, I just, yeah, I think I think it's hysterical. I think it's it's awesome. It makes coming to work even that much more enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, you get to play the game when you watch the episode. That's like, okay, what references are in this episode? Right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I th- I don't think I've ever told this story before, but um, there's a little nerd shop um, that's like by my parents' house. They live out in Delta, so like Ladner or Tawasa in that area. Um, anyways, there's this little nerd shop that's in Ladner, and, um, so anyways, I just went in there because I saw that they had some Doctor Who paraphernalia one day, and, uh, so I walked in, and, you know, the sign said open, but there was clearly something going on, like, I think it was, like, a Dungeons and Dragons kind of meeting, like, of, like, people, and, um, anyways, I walk in, and I, like, the room goes silent, and I think I was the only (laughs) female in the room, and I was like, hi, um, so I saw you just had some Doctor Who stuff, and uh, the, all the guys turned around, and there were some bronies. They were wearing pony shirts, and uh, they didn't know who I was, and that, that was fine with me, but, you know, then they start grilling me about Doctor Who, like, who's your favorite doctor? And, um, you know, like, what was your favorite? So blah, 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 which I thought was hysterical. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they greatly supported my purchase of um, Dalek and uh, a Dalek and uh, Tardis uh, set of salt and pepper shakers, which I was very proud of. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was on my way, but I just thought that was so awesome. Like, it, it, I don't know, it was just a bizarre but really hilarious experience that I just will never forget. <laughs> so, did so, the did the bronies in that shop ever figure out who you were, or are they just blissfully ignorant to this day? If 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 they did, then um, it was after I left because they didn't say anything and I didn't say anything um, when I was in the shop just because I just figured it's like, oh, well, you know, they're doing their thing. I'm doing my thing. If, you know, they say something or, you know, 
uh, want to talk about it, that's one thing, but I'm not going to push it on them. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it, it, it's always, that's another thing, like going to uh, different places and seeing people wear shirts from the show or like have, or kids like have merchandise from the show. That's what blows my mind. It's like, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just, uh, uh, it, 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 it's just like, I, I can't even describe it. I'm out of loss for words. It's just how uh, fun it is to see to see the fans in, in in everyday life, right? Like, and I saw it like I was just in Disneyland with my sister, and yeah, we saw a whole bunch of people wearing brony shirts, and uh, just walked past them, and I was like, "That's awesome!" You know, worldwide, huh. cool. So you uh, you've had a lot of really good interactions with the fandom overall. I I, I I'd like to think so. Yes. <laughs> well, I can think of. Um... You've even actually done a few, well, I guess I wouldn't really call it a fan work, but you did a song with uh, Andy Stein, uh, Mando Pony. Oh, I did. Yes, It yes. was not Pony at all, it was musical theater. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. that was very well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's just, uh, Andy and I, we met at Everfree Northwest in, um, in 2012, and, you know, we just would always... Like, I don't know, we just started talking about music because he was playing there, and I watched his little concert he gave. And we just started talking about music and a possible collaboration, and um, I just thought, okay, sure, you know, why not? Like, he, he's really, he's a very nice guy, and I think he's a very talented musician. And, yeah, then we, I just, I messaged him one day, like, uh, on, in, on Facebook or something, I said, hey, Andy, like, you know, I think that there's this great song called Taylor the Latte Boy. It's actually pretty well known in the musical theater realm, um, but they also have a guy's version of it, too. I think it'd just be really funny if we did this, like, just for laughs, like, why not? And so I recorded my bit at home, um, just in my bedroom, and then he recorded his bit, I think, in his little uh, makeshift studio at his home, and then I sent him the files, he put it together, put it up on YouTube, and yeah, like, it's just really for for our enjoyment and the fans enjoyment and just to make music for the sake of so yeah it's it's been a definite pleasure working with him and uh i'll put a link to that in the description as well so lots of links in the description guys oh thank you thank you thank you (laughs) (laughs) i have no idea how to do that so i'm glad that you're on it (laughs) uh i'm learning as i go (laughs) (laughs) the uh the 24-hour stream was really the first thing like this that I'd ever done. So it, it's a process you learn, and it, it, yeah. it'll happen. Right. <laughs> so I think we have time for just a couple more questions here. All uh, right. So this is something that I am actually kind of curious in, is the the your OC that... Pixel Kitties created. The cutie yes. mark is T and lace. It's uh, yes. Um, well, it's well. Uh, yes, lace and T. But I, I didn't really take it as lace. I thought it was just a really nice kind of a vine or floral kind of design. So, are you like, are you a big fan of T? Like that? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> just <laughs> really? No. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't. How did you not know this? Yes, of course, of course. Um, no, I'm just teasing you. Uh, yes, I am a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of tea, a big tea drinker. Any involved with tea, whether it be teapots, teacups, I collect them. I guess another nerdy, dirty secret <laughs> about me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's me. So if collecting teacups is nerdy, then what about collecting nerdy teacups? Oh, I'm down for that, too. Like, uh, don't get me wrong. Like, you should see how many Dr. Who mugs <laughs> I have. Um, and so I guess that's, the, like, okay, like, I guess the teacup thing, it's not so much nerdy. It's just kind of old ladyish. but I think I am an old lady at heart um, <laughs> already because by the time 12 o'clock rolls around at night, I'm dead tired, and all I want to do is go to sleep. Um, I love cats <laughs> and Knitting, so yeah, I may be pretty much stuck in a twenty-something-year-old body. Um, but yes, nerdy teacups, I am totally down for. I haven't really found a nerdy one yet, but you know, 
if I ever do, I will let you know. I, I have a friend who works at a, a university here in Los Angeles, and she is in the science department, and so science companies are always getting her free stuff because they want her lab to buy their products. Right. And right. she gives me a lot of the free stuff that she gets because she has no room left in her condo. <laughs> and so I have mugs that are like biotechnology companies and I have flash drives that are like uh, one flash drive is like it literally looks like a human finger and you pull off the top part and you plug it in. Oh god. It's, it's oh, fantastically nerdy fun. stuff. Fantastic. Well, that one's fantastically nerdy morbid. <laughs> it's a, it's a company that actually sells like um human cells and stuff. Oh, you could sell human cells. I didn't know that. It's slightly, you know, it's good to know, but slightly frightening. It's like, would you like one of my human cells? It's only $500, you know, like crazy. I well, if you that. need a sample of like white, white blood cells, oh, red blood cells, whatever. <laughs> it's like, I honestly didn't know you could do this. And then she gave me the flash drive. And the funny thing is, is I plugged it in for the first time. So I was going to put some files on it to go take to, um, back when I was in school yeah. and I was going to take him to the school computer uh -huh. and work on my files there at school. And I plugged it in and there's a little thing that was on there and I was like, Oh, it's demo stuff. So I opened it and it's, it was their catalog. Oh, wow. Oh, it was, no. I admit morbidly I just, fascinating. I, yeah. Oh gosh. Like, Oh, oh my, <clears throat> like that, that is great. Sorry. That just, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Like, yeah, morbidly fascinating. That's a very good way to describe that. Yeah, I guess that. my point is, is I'm <laughs> down with the nerdy collecting stuff. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I'm totally down for it, too. Maybe not red blood cells or white <laughs> blood cells. Like, I'm talking more like Doctor Who. That's, like, my version of nerdy. But, hey, whatever. That's good, too. There's nothing like waking up in the morning and sipping coffee out of a semen, uh, Simmons biotechnology mug. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Not that I know that, but I'll take your word for it. You have your Doctor Who, I have nerdy science yeah. stuff. We're all even. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. All right, so just going to wrap it up with a couple of easy questions. Okay. If you could voice any character on My Little Pony, who would it be? Oh. Oh, oh no. Um, like, that's already existing? Just or a new character maybe you want to introduce a new villain you know what i would love what i would seriously love and i now that i think of it i should have i would really love to like pitch this to anybody on the show like i don't know it'd be awesome if they could have like doctor who has like a a, a real sidekick like that's like rose tyler or like amy pond or something like that would cool like that that would make me really really happy if they gave her gave him like a, a, an official sidekick that'd be really cool there was one of the episodes i think it's season four where for a split second dr hooves and rose luck walked across the foreground yeah but see no 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 not just walking across like i mean like an established companion mm. that cool that that actually right? would be right? very interesting yes <laughs> yeah so, and they would have a special, like, episode and a spinoff series just for Dr. Who. No, I'm teasing. teasing. <laughs> yes, but, of course, naturally, that would make my day. And <clears throat> do you have any tips or tricks or anything for aspiring singers, dancers, voice actors out there? Um, aspiring tips. I would say just work hard and have fun. That's a phrase my dad always said to me growing up. And um, what I like, what he always meant by that is just do what you love, and the rest will just happen and fall into place uh, if you work hard at it and you just keep pursuing your dreams and do not give up. Uh, I told a story at BronyCon. You might have heard it. You might have not. Um, but. Growing up, I rode a lot of horses um, with my elder sister, and I remember one day I got bucked off the horse, and it was really scary for me, and I didn't want to go back. 
And my dad, uh, he came home with a book uh, later that day. And uh, in the book, it was a picture book, uh, the, this girl, she's a horseback rider. She gets thrown off the horse. And my dad had written um, in pen next to the drawing. Uh, he said, Kazumi, this has happened to me a lot before, because he used to ride horses a lot as well in his younger days. Kazumi, this has happened to me before. Um, and I know it's real scary, but just remember, whether in horseback riding or in life, always get back up on the horse. And I, yeah, and I was really young when this happened, but I, I've never forgotten that. And I guess I've always kind of taken that through life. And if I feel there's one thing I have been half decent at in my life, it's getting back up after a hard fall. And uh, in this industry, whether it's singer, uh, as a singer, dancer, or an actor, you're going to go through a lot of ups and downs. That's just the way things go in their career in the performing arts. And, um, you know, you're going to face a lot of rejection, and a lot of people are going to tell you no, or what, or who they think you should be. But at the end of the day, if you know who you are, and you love what you do, always get back up, and always fight and uh, fight for what you believe in and fight for what you love and the rest should fall into place and as one final thing uh, I have to say this because uh, Ross who would usually work with me on these things but couldn't be here today uh, really really he sent me a message saying can you please get her to say something as adagio as Adagio, yes. What would you like me to he say? He specifically requested the line, it's equestrian magic, like you're being angry at Sonata. Angry. Oh, oh yes, okay, that one line. Okay. <laughs> it's equestrian magic. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Kazumi. Thank you so much, Brad. It's been a pleasure. It has been an absolute honor recording this with you. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you again for having me. All right, so that was the wonderful Kazumi Evans, everyone. Thank you, and this is Dark Phoenix for HarmonyCon, signing off.